AEW has lots of championships, and as such, there's been lots of championship reigns this year, and as the quote goes, sometimes maybe good, and sometimes I'm not allowed to swear on YouTube, so not so good. I'm Sai for What Culture Wrestling, and here is every AEW championship reign of 2023 ranked from worst to best. Number 26, Wardlow AEW TNT Championship. Not to put the cart before the horse, because Orange Cassidy's international title reign is going to appear much later, of course, but I wanted to mention it now, because of this incredible stat, that during Cassidy's international title reign, Wardlow lost the TNT Championship three times, which is... I guess kind of impressive. This one refers to his second title win from Samoa Joe at Revolution, which he dropped then to Powerhouse Hobbs, three days later. So how could it be anything but the bottom of this list? If you didn't think AEW was guilty of some of the things that WWE could be guilty of, this is the most obvious use of a transitional champion ever. Number 25, Ray Phoenix and John Moxley, AEW International Championship. This low ranking for both of them is really just a victim of circumstance, and with 37 days between the two, there's not really much point in ranking them separately. Let's all just wrap this up together as, you know, probably one of the most cursed moments in AEW. We had John Moxley beating Orange Cassidy and ending the impressive Orange Cassidy International title raid to set up a match at full gear. He goes one-on-one -on -one with Ray Phoenix and unfortunately suffers a concussion in the match and calls an audible for Phoenix to go over. Now, of course, Moxley didn't know that Phoenix was going to have visa issues, so this brand new, exciting cruiserweight champion, basically, couldn't go anywhere. So AEW had to course correct, put the belt back on Orange Cassidy. It was the right thing to do. They were able to do their full gear match just in a slightly different way. Nobody's to blame for this. Again, it's just unfortunate. So it couldn't really be any higher than this. Number 24, Darby Allen, AEW TNT Championship. There's nothing wrong with moving around a belt a lot if it's done in the right way and if it's defended in interesting ways and often, which, you know, the TNT Championship should be because it's essentially the TV title for the brand. But a lot of this year, the belt has been passed around a lot of the same guys. So, for example, Joe comes into the year as TNT Championship in January, loses the belt to Darby Allen, and then less than a month later just wins it back again. There's been a lot of what was the point of that with the TNT Championship in 2023, but this is the most egregious example. Darby looks great with the belt round his shoulder, of course. He's a great TNT Championship. It's a really nice fit. But being less than a month and dropping it back to the same guy, it really just felt like a needless diversion from Samoa Joe's reign at the end of the day. Number 23, Wardlow AEW TNT Championship. When looking at up and coming stars in AEW, there might not be anyone who's been fumbled as badly as Wardlow you know, in general, but also this year. This refers to his second TNT Championship, which he won back from Powerhouse Hobbs after Hobbs had it for something like a month. And then Wardlow himself dropped it again after three months, no, two months and three title defenses, I think it was. Wardlow, you know, desperately needed a bit of a rebrand, something fresh to do to try and grasp onto any heat that he might have had left and they just put the belt back on him, which the belt felt pointless at this point, and unfortunately, so did Wardlow. Number 22, Julia Hart AEW TBS Championship and Tony Storm AEW World Women's Championship. I'm putting these together for the sake of expediency and because at the time of speaking, they really only just got the belt a few weeks ago, so it's kind of hard to rank their reigns at all. What I can say at least that this, you know, this is the right decision for both championships. Both great women. Julia Hart easily described as one of AEW's most improved stars over 2023, so that makes sense. And Tony Storm's timeless gimmick is over, so that makes sense. Can't say anything more than that right now. Hopefully both of them have some, you know, decently lengthy reigns with these belts. Here's to the future. Cool. Number 21, Death Triangle AEW World Trios Championship. Again, this is just another low ranking purely because of circumstance, because this reign ended 11 days into 2023. That said, Death Triangle had the belts for 127, I think it was, in total. And overall, it was a pretty good run, considering the belts started off in a really bad place. They were essentially invented to be put around the waist of the Elite. And the night that that happens, of course, is all out. So all the backstage drama occurs, and suddenly the belts need new owners. And Death Triangle did their absolute best with it. They put on a great run overall really no complaints and it ended on a high with the best of seven series you know culminating 
in January this year. So overall, pretty decent. Number 20, Hikaru Shida, AEW World Women's Championship. Shida brings a certain level of prestige to the AEW Women's Championship and an international flair as well, and it felt like a nice moment for her to win the belt for the second time, because of course many fans remember her having the title for 372 days through the bulk of the empty arena era of AEW, so this was a nice reward for you, you know, hey, win it in front of a crowd. After that though, it did feel a little bit insincere because this happened to, I wouldn't say pop a rating, but to mark a Dynamite's 200th episode, and I, I don't know, that's fine. But then it felt like, you know, it was doomed because only a few weeks later she'd be defending it in Wembley, which was great that she got to do that. But it felt like, well, a title change is probably going to happen at Wembley. So it was kind of overall insincere is the best word I can think for it. It was a nice moment that just kind of went, oh, you're not actually building anything in the women's division. This is just moving the belt around, which we're going to see is an unfortunate thing that happened throughout the year. Number 19, Soraya, AEW Women's World Championship. This entry is absolutely going to get some flack and I'm prepared for that, absolutely. Soraya coming out of early retirement to wrestle in front of a home crowd and win the Women's Championship was a nice feel good moment, of course. But overall, when you look at it broadly, all it really did was continue to harm the already reduced prestige of this belt. AEW has been under constant and deserved flack for the way they've booked their women's division. It's just, you know, I want the belt. No, I want the belt. Let's move the belt around until the belt doesn't mean anything anymore. And yeah, it's a nice moment, but it's the bare minimum to put on a local hero and get a cheap pop. And even then, it doesn't make any sense because the outcasts weren't over. And if they were, they were heels. So why do the cheap... I mean, I know a cheap pop is a cheap pop and wrestling ever shades of grey but it didn't make any sense and yeah it's you needed to fix your systematic issue of booking the women's division poorly instead of just going look we put it on the one you like in this town mm. Number 18, Hikaru Shida, AEW World Women's Championship Shida winning the title on a special episode of Dynamite, wow haven't heard that one before. This could have been course correction, and at the time it kind of felt like it. They went, okay, we put the belt on Shida, we took the belt off Shida, we put the belt on Shida, we get it, we're messing around. This time, we might actually commit to something. We did our cheap popper all in. This is the real follow-up Shida run. She defended the title three times in the space of eight days, and then suddenly dropped it to Tony Storm. And I know I put over putting the belt on Tony Storm because the character is so over, but again, it just doesn't feel like the right way to treat your 372 day holding champion through the pandemic era. Great, she's now the first woman to hold the belt three times. That's, that's nice, I suppose. But what does the belt mean when you've moved it around so much? You've moved it around, like I just said, twice, three times in the space of a couple of months. What was the point? Number 17, Orange Cassidy, AEW International Championship. This, of course, refers to Cassidy's second reign with the title this year, which, as said, got kind of cursed for a little while there, so it made sense to put it back on Old Reliable with Cassidy, and it you know, allowed AEW to have the match that they were building towards, and it made the belt feel... It restored some of that prestige because it was part of a big match, part of a big feud, the biggest match of Cassidy's career, but now I suppose the question is, you know, what's next? What do they do next with this belt? Does he go on to continue to dominate the mid card and defend it on a regular basis like he did prior? Do we get into another big feud with another big opponent? Or is it time for something new entirely? I think the main event scene in AEW is probably too busy for Orange Cassidy right now, but you have to wonder how long until he feels bigger than this belt. That being said, at the very least, it's very interesting to see what they could potentially do with Cassidy into the new year while he has the strap. And when he drops it for a second and more definitive time, it's going to feel like a big deal. Number 16, The Guns, AEW World Tag Team Championship. Heels in wrestling are an interesting thing, of course, because we all do it. We all cheer the bad guys. The bad guys are more interesting. So when you can find a character that gets under the skin of even the most smarky fan, like a Baron Corbin in WWE, or like the guns in AEW, maybe it should be applauded because people were not happy about this, partly because they squirreled the champions off of the acclaimed while they were still over. 
Also partly because people thought FTR were, you know, gearing up to win the belts next and that felt like an obvious thing. And also simply because the guns weren't the most interesting tag team at the time. AEW had lots of great tag teams, they were not at that peak. I think overall though, it did quite good to, it did a good job of establishing them. Austin and Colton did really well with what they were given. It wasn't nearly the car crash that everyone was expecting it to be and they've managed to maintain it somewhat by being part of Bullet Club Gold. So overall, definitely could have been a lot worse. It didn't last particularly long, so I can't say for sure whether they really sunk or swam. It was just kind of, it was okay. Definitely not as bad as everyone made it out to be the instant that it happened. Number 15, Tony Storm, AEW World Women's Championship. When Jamie Hayter was the AEW Women's Championship, it finally felt like things might be going in the right direction. The wheels back on the track. So of course, everything had to go wrong with Hayter getting an injury that really sucks and a feel for her, of course. Putting the belt on Tony Storm, again, a logical decision. She's a safe bet. It's exactly what the company did with Thunder Rose's injury by making Storm the interim champion. And obviously, of course, that reign became lineal later on as well. The only problem is, is that, again, as part of the Outcasts, it just wasn't interesting TV. Like, the gimmick was very generic mean girl shtick. They didn't have any interesting opponents either, so they couldn't have really any interesting feuds. It was all just kind of a big, fat, bright green meh, which meant that Tony Storm's 66-day reign felt overall kind of directionless. Number 14, Powerhouse Hobbs AEW TNT Championship. Certainly, Powerhouse Hobbs is one of the more interesting TNT champions of this year. This long-serving, underrated member of the AEW roster. Great, in theory, in practice, it didn't really work, did it? And that is entirely the fault of the booking. Him winning the Face of the Revolution ladder match, getting a title shot and brutalizing Wardlow, great. Him aligning himself with QTV, not so much. A stable that was not interesting, nobody cared about. They managed to sap the charisma from every room they were in, including Wardlow's push here. It just fell apart instantly, and you could feel that in every which way because AEW just moved the belt about 40 something days later over to Wardlow again and Powerhouse Hobbs hasn't really done a whole lot of stuff of note since which it sucks. Number 13 the Elite AEW World Trios Championship. The Elite winning the Trios Championship was essentially a foregone conclusion but that doesn't have to be a bad thing if you've got a team that essentially built your company, of course you're going to put your trios championships on them. And you, you know, you could say that's narcissism, of course, but when they can go like the elite can, I don't know if you can really justify that claim. Also, it just made sense coming out of the suspension, coming back to TV, they needed something good, they needed something to remind you who they were and why you were watching them to distract you from potentially talking about the suspension again. Let's just put on a bunch of awesome matches. The best of seven series was great overall, of course, um, and the rain kind of continued that. It was, there wasn't a lot in terms of feud, it was more about singing Wayward Son and just great television matches. So, hard to complain. Number 12, Ricky Starks and Big Bill, AEW World Tag Team Championship. Open challenges are usually pretty good for that, you know, you did your best kid, but try again next time kind of way to build somebody up. But we're the champs here and that's why we defend every week. So when a surprise comes along, I mean, it's great because wrestling surprises don't really come along very often anymore. But as part of an open challenge, for some reason it always feels like a big deal, especially because the pairing of Big Bill and Ricky Starks was really new and really weird. So for them to beat FTR, you know, one of the biggest tag teams on the planet, on a random episode of Collision, that was a nice surprise. It's also been a really good rehabilitation for both of the guys. Ricky Starks as a character, someone who was super over, who kind of got lost in the shuffle. It's been good for him to do something new um, and have him give him a good place on the card. And Big Bill, of course, like as a guy, the demons that he's had and the stuff that he's been through, it's nice to see him succeeding, winning at life, if you like, by uh, getting the tag belts. And that feels a real, you know, heartwarming moment. This surprise is the kind of thing that AEW needs more of every now and then. So more of this, please. Number 11, the House of Black AEW World Trios Championship. 
Do you ever really want something and then when you get it, it's kind of a disappointment? Like House of Black as Trio's Championship just made sense. With their presentation already making them one of the most engrossing stables in AEW, putting the belts on them was just like next level stuff. And the win was great, of course, but then what? Like what happens after that? And you know, you can't complain about the quality of their matches, super entertaining to watch. Whatever you think of supernatural characters or plot lines though, they are characters that probably could have benefited more from stories, from being these guys on the throne, mocking and thwarting their opponents and getting in their heads and doing all this interesting stuff instead of doing more open challenges, which seems to be a bit of a default thing for AEW champions to do. Just maybe it's the easy answer. It was fine, it was entertaining, but even though they had the belts for like 170 days, it was kind of forgettable. Number 10, Samoa Joe, AWTNT Championship. Joe's actually had two reigns with this belt this year, but we're going to ignore the first one because it was literally four days long at the beginning of January. And uh, we'll focus on the second, which was kind of when the, the TNT title was in the midst of the big scary dude era, which was something because through most of 2023, as is obvious, it didn't feel like AEW knew what they were doing with it and nobody really knew what it was for, like what its identity even was. But when it was moving around, Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs and Samoa Joe, admittedly way too much, but all the same, at least it had kind of an identity in this is for the big Hoss fights. And Samoa Joe, obviously the best guy for that. He has such a career behind him and, you know, still ahead of him as well. He's still impressive to watch, but it felt like you're putting your belt on a big, important star. So that's going to help. And it was alongside the Ring of Honor TV title. He was really strapped up. It helped his perception. It helped the perception of both titles. And then it ended, you know, 30 days in, of course. So it can't rank any higher than here. Number nine, the acclaimed AEW World Tag Team Championship. AEW at its best is the land of opportunity, and perhaps no one exemplifies that better than Caster and Bowens coming into 2023 as one of the most over prospects in the company after being, you know, not a forgettable heel faction by any means, but I don't think anybody expected them to be the big babyface unit that they became. They only had about 30 minutes of defense time with the titles in 2023 since they dropped them in quite surprising fashion in February after about 140 days. So they can't rank higher than they are, but that said, as a complete package, that run was hugely entertaining. It was must-see TV, of course, and it's really put the guys on the map. It might be the first tag title reign, but it's far from going to be their last. Number eight, FTR AEW World Tag Team Championships. FTR winning the AEW Tag Team Championships was inevitable in 2023, but it's hard to argue that he didn't come too late. Obviously, at one point, they were really strapped up with the IWGP tag titles, the AAA tag titles, the ROH tag titles. It was an incredible visual and kind of hilarious because, I mean, it looked incredibly uncomfortable to be carrying around all that hardware, but fans really wanted them to get the AEW tag titles to complete all of that. Unfortunately, when it did come, it was after they lost all the belts, so some of the interest had certainly waned. And if you didn't watch Collision at all, you pretty much miss most of the rain. Their original tag rain was about 60 something days and was kind of a letdown. This, I don't, I think this was better, but I still feel like they haven't hit the mark with what people want out of FTR, FTR as tag champions, which is a shame. Still obviously great to watch, but the timing was off. Number seven, the acclaimed AEW World Trios Championship. Obviously, booking should be about more than belt. That said, when the acclaimed lost their tag titles, it felt like they had to find something new to do and the Trios Championship was clearly it. Billy Gunn's sort of false retirement angle was a little bit forced, but it was hard not to get behind the babyface push of let's put the belt on Mr. Ass one last time. And of course, you knew the company had stock in it because when they did win, they got the pink strap. And of course, it goes to show what I said before about them being heels, turning babyface and having the audience eat out of the palm of their hand. They're quite memorable, despite the fact they haven't actually wrestled on pay-per-view since winning the Trios Championship outside of the Zero Hour. So it really goes to show how big of a deal they actually are. Number six, Chris Statlander, AEW TBS Championship. Selecting the star who will topple the massive history-making reign must be a challenge, 
But it was universally agreed upon that Chris Statlander grabbing the TBS Championship off of Jade Cargill was the right move. She's a known AEW identity coming back from injury to a huge pop, and she could offer something new to that title that Cargill couldn't, of course, as a babyface, as a whole roster of opponents for her to face. And not to downplay Cargill at all, we'll get there, obviously, able to put on some more competitive and more interesting matchups and just different matchups to what we'd had up until that point. It didn't overstay its welcome. Most importantly, they didn't try and kind of do that formula again and have Statlander go on a crazy winning streak. It felt like a big moment. They did some different stuff with her. They used the time well, and then they moved the belt on. Overall, no complaints. Number five, Jamie Hayter, AEW World Women's Championship. Even if AEW's women's division didn't feel like a poorly put together farce most of the time, Jamie Hayter winning the title was 100% the right move. She was over as a babyface and it felt like everything was heading in the right direction because she had a bunch of storyline stuff going on. She was under fire, or potentially under fire, from loads of different directions. Admittedly, one of these was the outcasts, who as I say were horribly boring, the NWO women's light version. Never particularly interesting. What was interesting, of course, though, was what was bubbling away under the surface. Jamie Hayter's mentor, Britt Baker, the former power-hungry champ, standing beside her, just kind of biding her time. It was increasingly obvious for the audience that this was going to happen at some point. And hey, exciting storyline. Who would have thought? It is really unfortunate that the injury stopped this storyline and stopped what was overall a really strong 190-day title reign. Get well soon, Jamie Hayter. We miss you desperately. Number four, Luchasaurus and Christian Cage, AEW TNT Championship. Yes, it's technically two reigns, but Christian Cage winning the title off of Luchasaurus, or maybe Killswitch now, I guess, was really just a formality. The big guy having the belt, that was just in name only. Christian was literally the guy holding it. And it just made sense to put the belt on him proper, because as funny as the Delusions of Grandeur thing kind of was, he needed to be able to do more with it. And it actually added to his hunger for the belt a bit more that he would, you know, be the guy to beat Luchasaurus in a triple threat match. He didn't pin his own heater, but that made the title seem like a more interesting prospect. It was something new, it was something unique, and it's lifted it out of the dirt where it's been for a long time because Christian, as the patriarch, one of the most detestable heels in AEW right now, cheating to win, running away from confrontation in order to keep his grubby mitts on that belt, He's done quite a lot, again, as an established star like Samoa Joe, to raise the stock of the TNT Championship so that hopefully some new fresh face can eventually be the one to take it off him. Maybe Luchasaurus, maybe someone else entirely. Number three, Jade Cargill, AEW TBS Championship. Whether or not AEW needed or needs a mid-card women's title is certainly a question without an answer at this point. But at one point it did have an answer, and the answer was Jade Cargill using it perfectly to elevate herself. Obviously as a competitor who was a tad limited in the ring, and she's early into her career and she has a tremendous upside, so there's absolutely no slight there. It was all about the presentation and they did an incredible job with it. Cargill was great in backstage interviews, she had an incredible look, and AEW did their best, I think, to put over the street with all the match graphics and stuff like that, playing on the, they don't call it the Tron in AEW, but the screens behind her and stuff like that every time she won. It steadily made it feel like a big deal, and it made Cargill feel like a big deal, which is what the belt is all about. Especially with mid-card titles, it's meant to elevate a star, and it really did, to the point where you know, of course, she can get scooped up by the market leader because of how big a deal she felt and how much upside she put on display. The women's world title in AEW, nobody's really put their mark on that since Britt Baker in the same way. Jamie Hayter got close, but TBS Championship and Jade Cargill, despite the fact that she's now dropped the belt and gone to WWE, already, or rather still, in fact, I should say, synonymous with each other. Number two, Orange Cassidy, AEW International Championship. AEW has a belt problem and it's about to make it worse by adding another one to it at the time of speaking with the Continental Championship. People already reacted with scorn and questions when the All-Atlantic, now International Championship, was unveiled, wondering what the point of it was. But over the last year, it's absolutely overshadowed their other mid-card prize, the TNT Championship, and it all comes down to one man. 
The International Championship absolutely became the workhorse championship of AEW with 32 defences in 11 months. It was a combination of making sure the title was featured, often opening episodes of Dynamite, and the right man to do it, of course, because Orange Cassidy, one of the most over babyfaces in the company, which again makes a nice change because a lot of heels holding belts throughout this year, so nice to have a nice lengthy babyface run, but also more than that, he allowed the championship to affect his character, going from kind of lackadaisical to the guy who was going to try and made that a big part of him. Allowing the championship to change your character makes the championship feel like a big deal, funnily enough. This is the perfect example of one helping the other and vice versa. Orange Cassidy was already massively over, but now, as I said before, he's nearly ready to enter the main event scene if it wasn't so full of guys already and the international championship feels like the second biggest title in the company and number one mjf aew world championship speaking of the biggest prize in the company 2023 belongs to maxwell jacob friedman and the aew world title has just been waiting for him this entire time when he won it in 2022 into 2023 it's been a really exciting run going from the biggest scumbag on earth having a refresh which I don't even think he was really getting sour, but they got ahead of the curve by turning him face, something that didn't seem like it could ever be done by turning him from, yeah, a huge prick into this fragile, broken man willing to give friendship another shot. And more than just as a character and storylines, and absolutely, MJF's title run has delivered some of the most cutting drama that the company has ever produced right up there with the hangman stuff maybe just a notch below but it depends on your tastes also the ring work has been incredible like mjf has really blurred the line of being i'm the best guy around by putting on a 60 minute match against brian danielson and working against the likes of samoa joe tanahashi and so on putting on some incredible matches this year this isn't just the best title reign of the year in AEW and probably any other company as well, but it will leave a huge mark on the history of this championship and company going forwards. And that's every AEW Championship reign of the year, ranked from worst to best. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below, what have been your favorite and least favorite championship reigns of the year. Here's another great video from the channel that you should watch appearing on screen now. Please, we appreciate you. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe. I've been Cypher Culture, and have a good week.